the, this multiple, the disability on multiple, multiple sclerosis is usually measured using the EDSS scale, where that it goes from one to 10, where one is like no symptoms at all, and the nine, the patient can be confined to bed. And uh, the, the gray matter volume in the spinal cord was the strongest predictor of this disability in the in patients, right? So this this is uh, this this has a major relevance for multiple sclerosis, and uh, this is a is histology, a slice of the spinal cord where we can see that there is a clear differentiation on this on this spinal cord on the gray matter and, and white matter, uh, but the main issue is that on MRI it looks like this, right? It's a very small tissue that is very difficult to, to segment and the manual labeling of this tissue can take, can take a lot of time, especially if you have a lot of patients, right, and on large studies. And uh, the problem is that uh, it's also uh, introduced biases when there's multiple notators, they often uh, don't agree with the voxels that are kind of in, in the border of this uh, butterfly shape of the gray matter. So this is problematic and uh, therefore providing an algorithm that can do this automatic segmentation is very important because we can, can at least try to uh, mitigate, partially mitigate this bias. At least we can reach to the, you know, like the expectation of multiple raters of this, multiple annotators of this uh, segmentation masks. And it's of course very interesting for uh, larger studies because if you have an automatic tool, you don't have to go through every slice to segment it. And then I will show also a, a study on next vivo that uh, just one volume had uh, like almost 4,000 slices. So manually segmenting all those slices is unfeasible, right? So the main question that guided the research goals is what can modern deep learning techniques bring to this segmentation of the gray matter, right? And uh, the first research goal here was to how can we improve the previous state of the art on gray matter segmentation using deep learning? <coughs> Uh, the second uh, problem is how to handle this small data regime that's very common biomedical imaging. We have uh, we usually have data, but we don't have labels. So this is one problem that we face in medical imaging uh, in general. And how to handle this domain shift that is also very common in medical imaging because sometimes you acquire data in one center and then you go to another center that where they use a different parameterization, you acquire a different contrast, or you even uh, use a different machine vendor that can cause differences in the in those volumes, right? So there's a, diff, uh, a what's called a shift in, in distribution of this data when you change centers or change machines, right? Uh, so we'll talk now about deep learning for segmentation, right? But first, what is deep learning, right? For, uh, this is a very short introduction to it. So machine learning is basically learning with data, right? If there is no data, there is no machine learning. Uh, you assume that there is a pattern in your data, and this is a circular concept because in the end, you don't know, the, the data is so high dimensional that you don't know if there's a pattern in there before applying those techniques, right? So you, you must assume that there is a pattern. Right? Uh, and you assume also that data is available. You might not require labels from some techniques, but you, you need to have data. So data is a requirement for this, right? And, uh, so what's the difference between deep learning and machine learning is that on deep learning, it can be considered like a shift on the traditional uh, manual feature extraction that we had on uh, traditional machine learning techniques. There's no proper definition of deep learning. It's usually a set of things that are present in, in those techniques. And another uh, important feature that learning is that it, it does automatically feature extraction. So you don't have to, you don't need an expert to do manual feature extraction from images or other kind of data. And uh, it uses uh, also hierarchical features because you have, it's called deep because of this, you have many layers on the user, usually it's uh, on using neural networks and you have many layers. And in those layers, they learn to extract the hierarchical features, right? And this works very well because nature is mostly compositional. Right? Uh, so in machine learning, you have data, uh, you, you use it to extract features and then you train your model and your model will produce predictions, right? And uh, for, Checking if those predictions are okay in training your model, you need to, to provide labels to the algorithm, and you need a, a learning algorithm that will train your model, right? And to extract features, you need an expert that knows uh, what are the kind of features that would be important to segment or to, or to for the task that we're trying to predict, right? And in, in deep learning, we have the same thing. We have data, uh, and but we skip this part here on the features. We just have the, our model that will automatically learn how to extract those features, and we have predictions, right? And for the predictions, we need labels and also a learning algorithm. So it's a kind of a 
shortcut that uh, that uh, that introduces this kind of uh, representation learning, right? It, because it will learn to extract representation that are useful for the task at hand. Uh, so just to formalize the, the framework, and uh, in this part in this part of the work, we're more, mostly interested in supervised learning because we have input data and we have ground truth. So in my case, uh, I have this data set, which are pairs of uh, MRI volumes and uh, the ground truths, right? That are, was uh, manually labeled by some experts, and uh, which in my case is just the, the gray matter, right? So. Uh, the main goal in the end of to train those models is that we want to find this model F that is parameterized by this theta, which are the parameters of the model. And this model will just describe the relationship between the input and the output labels. Uh, in the end, we want to uh, minimize this function using a loss function, which is nothing more than a way to, to, to tell the learning algorithm that uh, if the model is performing well or not, based on the ground truth that uh, we have that was produced by the manual uh, annotation. Uh, those models, they, they can be uh, from many different classes of models. One of the very common models in deep learning for uh, computer vision is the convolutional neural networks, uh, where you basically have uh, interleaved layers of convolutional pooling and sometimes in the end uh, uh, fully connected layers that will provide a kind of classification. But modern architectures does, does not even contain these uh, fully connected layers anymore. So it's a uh, in the end, it's a class of uh, architectures where you can change a lot of components inside of it. Uh, but the main point here is that you have convolution and they are, uh, they are decimating information, aggregating information to perform a, uh, a final classification from the, the, the image that you have uh, as input. Uh, most of the work in, uh, in, uh, in uh, machine learning, uh, in uh, using convolutional neural networks in deep learning, uh, use direct convolutions, which is just a filter that is lights on uh, on this input data, right? And then produces a uh, a output here. So you have this entire image here that let, let's say that's an image uh, that's a very small image, and there there's this three by three filter that slides on on it um, on this way. Uh, it produces an output, right? So this is uh, one way to for the network to extract features that are translational uh, invariant in the in the image, right? Uh, however, the problem with convolutions is that you need to increase the receptive field because if you have a just three by three filter, you only see a very tiny piece of the input data that you have. So one way to increase this, uh, this receptive field is to add more and more, stack more and more convolutional layers or even use pooling. Uh, however, the problem with pooling is that it uh, creates what is called rotation invariance and also uh, uh, this becomes a problem when you're doing segmentation because if you rotate your input, you want your output also to rotate it. You know, you want the mask to uh, to follow the input data. And when you have pooling, you introduce invariance to this. So what might happen is that you change your input and you might have this degree of uh, invariance in the output uh, that will cause problems in segmentation, right? So another way that was introduced uh, to overcome this issue with direct convolutions is dilated convolutions. You just put zeros in, uh, on your filter, right? So you expand uh, the receptive field of those convolutional filters. Uh, and the good part of it is that you don't need to add more parameters. You just expand your filter by putting zeros on it. And it increases the receptive field without adding a lot of parameters. And uh, you don't have to put pooling anymore in, in the middle of this. And this provides a very nice property that's called translation equivariance. So every time that you change something in the, in the input of the network, it will change in the output as well on the same level. Uh, so what we did in this first work was to expand a architecture that was uh, developed by Google. It was, it was called DeepLab. Uh, what we did, we changed it a little in, in the beginning of the network. We removed the, all the pooling layers that was uh, in the beginning to, uh, to try to increase uh, this property of translation equ equivariance. And in this network, you just have the, uh, the, some initial convolutional layers that are not dilated, some dilated, and then you have this part that is the important part where you have multiple <coughs> uh, convolutional layers that are stacked in parallel instead of sequentially. And they have different weights of uh, dilation between each one. So they are kind of uh, ex aggregating features that are, uh, and each one of those layers, they have a different recept field uh, on the input image. Uh, then later they are all stacked together, they are concatenated together, and there's one-by-one -one convolution that provides this final segmentation mask here. 
uh, we participated on, a, we used this data on, a, on, a, on we used this model on a data from a challenge that's called spinal cord gray matter segmentation challenge. And this challenge had a four, four waiters and four different centers that provide labels for, this, uh, for all those patients. And we can see here that there's many metrics here, but the, one that's, uh, the ones that are most important, in my opinion, are the dice and the house of distance. And we can see that even when we compare to the, those are the all other methods that we compared with. And even when we compare to the other deep learning method that was using the unit, we can see that the dice went from 08 to 085. So it's a, it's a major improvement in the dice uh, just by changing uh, the network architecture, right? And without introducing anything fancy like a pre-processing or anything. So this is, very interesting because it's an end-to-end -end learning, right? You feed the input data, you, of course, you do normalization of the data, you feed the data as input, and then you get the, the gray matter segmentation at the end without any, any other kind of pre-processing or anything. Uh, we also applied this same model on ex vivo data. So we used, there, there was this volume that we got in collaboration with the Duke University. They acquired an ex vivo uh, spinal cord that, they, that has almost uh, 4,000, uh, 5,000 slices. And uh, we manually segmented, segmented only 25 slides and we trained our model and the model was able later to, uh, to segment this entire volume uh, with a reasonable accuracy. And uh, here is some results of it. And there's also a video here that show, yes, post show, yeah, okay. So those are the slices of the network. This video is going down in the spinal cord and it's showing that the red part here is the segmentation of the network and this is just the mask that was this red one. And uh, you can see even though the, the, the shape of the, the spinal cord uh, the, of the gray matter changed a lot, the network is able to follow it even though it was not trained with all those slices from this, uh, this volume, right? And uh, it is very nice to see that because uh, it was discovered later after they acquired this, uh, this spinal cord that uh, the spinal cord had a lesion on the gray matter. And they plotted the, the gray matter fraction here. And uh, we can see that in the moment when there is a lesion, it shows like a bump, uh, a bump on, the, on this profile of the gray matter fraction, uh, which is interesting because you can, uh, you can pose uh, the search of lesions in gray matter on those volumes uh, just by looking at outliers in this profile line of the gray matter. Uh, we also integrated this, uh, this module on FSLI, so uh, we implemented it on a CP, which is the framework that is developed by our lab. And it's mainly just a button. You just load the volume, you just press the button, and then you have this final part, uh, gray matter segmentation as a new layer. Uh, so one of the problems that we found is that Okay, we have labeled data and we are taking leverage of this label data. However, there's a lot of data that we have that where we don't have uh, labels for it. We don't have annotations, right? So, uh, and this is the main situation in, in medical imaging. We have data, but we don't have labels for it. So uh, the question that we did was how can uh, we use uh, this unlabeled data that's available to train those models as well, instead of just using labeled data, right? And uh, this also poses a, a problem for deep learning techniques because they have a, a, what is called a high sample complexity. They need a lot of data to produce a reasonable classifier. And this can be very problematic because in medical imaging, we don't have huge data sets such as the ImageNet that are used to do this transfer learning to other kind of uh, very related domains. Uh, so how do, to take advantage of this unlabeled data, right? The first question that we asked it was, uh, the first answer that came to us was to uh, use semi-supervised learning, right? Because this, uh, there was a lot of algorithms that were developed exactly for this, where you assume that you have labeled data, some points that were labeled, and you have like a huge pool of unlabeled data that you can use in those algorithms, right? So how those algorithms work, they usually assume that there is some structure in your data, right? So for instance here, you have positive and negative classes and you want to separate them with a classifier and uh, you can say that this, is, this will be a reasonable hyperplane separated this data, right? But if you have more unlabeled data, such as those ones, uh, and you assume that uh, data that clusters together belongs to the same class, you can use this unlabeled data as, uh, as, a, a, as an assumption to, to change your, your decision uh, hyperplane and change the way that you are classifying those, those, uh, those points, right? 
So what we did was the use a, a technique that's called the mean feature. And uh, this technique was developed only for classification. So what we did, we, we expanded it for segmentation, right? The way that this technique works is that you have this part here, that uh, this one, two, and five here, all this part here is just a traditional segmentation method. You have input data, you have your model, and you have predictions of your model, and then you have a segmentation loss, right? That compares with the label mass. And then in this technique, what you do is just duplicate your architecture. So you have what's called a student and teacher model, but they are the same architecture. And the teacher model is just an average of the student model during the training. So what happens is that this teacher model will have some uh, mathematical guarantees that it will be always a little better than the student model. So uh, the, student, the goal here is to make the student model learn from the teacher model, right? So you add another uh, loss here that's called a consistence loss besides the segmentation loss. So you have two losses in your network. And this consistence loss is just happening between the prediction of the student and the teacher. So you can see here that since this loss is just uh, being applied over the predictions of the networks, you don't, have, you don't need labels to compute this. So it opens the door for you to feed and label data through this channel here, right? So you feed and label data here, and those two, th those two models will learn from each other on a, a virtual cycle during the training. Uh, you can see here the results. We also use the, the same uh, challenge uh, data set that we had on Green Matter. And uh, we can see that the dice here, for instance, it came from 65 to 70. So it's a very nice improvement for the fact that you are not introducing any label data in the model. You're just, uh, you're just changing the way that you, that you train your models by, by not requiring any more annotation to get this improvement. So it's a kind of improvement that comes for free in your model. Right? Uh, so the problem with this is that uh, we often train those models with what is called an empirical risk minimization, right? So uh, in supervising setting, as I said before, we, had a, uh, we have this model web and we want to learn this relationship between the, uh, the X and Y variables, right? And uh, we start defining a loss, right? That will tell us how good our model is. And uh, uh, what we do is we take the expectation of this loss, which is just uh, the average of this loss over this entire, this, distribution, right? And this is called the risk of the model. So the risk of the model is just uh, the average of uh, our model uh, computed by this loss on this, on this distribution, right? And then we minimize, we minimize this, this loss, right? Uh, however, the problem is that we don't have access to this entire distribution here, right? Because if we had access to it, we would need to have access to all possible inputs and outputs from MRI machine and uh, for poss all possible segmentations for that. So we don't have access to it. And what we assume is that this <coughs> distribution exists and we have a sample from it, which is our data set. So our data set uh, is, is <coughs> a small portion of this distribution. And then what we do is that we uh, minimize the approximation of this uh, risk. That's, called, that's why it's called an empirical risk. Empirical because you are uh, minimizing, uh, taking consideration the data that you sampled from this distribution. Uh, so the, the empirical risk minimization principle is the, is the principle that, uh, that guides our training and deep learning, machine learning. And we basically reduce the loss on it and uh, to train our models and to make them learn, right? Uh, however, there are some problems with that because it assumes that, you know, like the, the distribution of the data that comes from training, training and test data sets, they come from the same, is the same distribution, right? So what happens uh, in real life is that this is not, uh, this is not, the, this is not the holding practice, right? Because on medical imaging and many other domains like uh, self-driving cars, this is very problematic because in the end, when you acquire data and uh, using one machine in one center, this data will have a different distribution from the other images that you capture on another center. Uh, so in self-driving cars, is, is very, this problem is also very evident. Some people capture data on a city and then they want to do this model to generalize on another city and the data is completely different, right? So uh, this is very problematic for deep learning. And this is just an example of the data. I think this is an histogram showing raw intensities of the MRI data. Uh, on the spinal cord gray matter segmentation challenge. And you can see that uh, different centers have very different profiles of uh, histogram. And it's, of course, that if you normalize them, they will be uh, much closer together, but they are still different. 
And this histogram is just showing the intensity of the pixels, right? That you can have also structural differences that might cause issues. So this can be one problem uh, when you train those models in, let's say, center one and two, and then you want to apply on, a, on other centers. Uh, so just a formalization of this, uh, a domain is just characterized by, just by the definition of X, which is input data, uh, Y data, and a probability, a joint probability distribution that will model uh, X to Y, right? And uh, uh, we say that a domain is different when the, there's at least one component of those two domains. For instance, let's assume that we have domain one and two, and uh, if there's X or Y or P are different, we say that those domains are different, right? So there's a field in machine learning that's called a <clears throat> domain adaptation that uh, is uh, was especially is especially attributed to try to solve those issues right uh, they try to learn a model on a training distribution and you still want this model to perform well on another distribution uh, that's different but is related to your original training data so many methods can be used to to, to do the main adaptation. It depends mostly if you have labeled data or not. But the issue is that we don't want to assume things that are not true in reality. Because if you assume that you will have labeled data from the target domain, it then is an easy problem. You just have to do fine tuning in your model on this target domain, and that's it. But the issue is that when a new lab sends data, they, they often don't have labeled data for you, or they just have a small portion of data to, to provide you. And, uh, there's of course a lot of interest in this field because it's uh, it's the, it, it, there's this natural drifting in distributions when uh, we are applying machine learning models in real life. So what we did in this work is is very similar to the semi-supervised learning technique, and uh, we use it also the mean teacher technique. Uh, the difference here is that now instead of having the you have the same supervised component here, it's just the traditional training. Uh, and you have now a different channel here that's just for the target uh, data, right? So you feed, uh, you feed your label data to train your student and teacher model, and you, the, you have the same consistency loss, but you have another channel that you feed unlabeled data, right? And you feed unlabeled data through those two models, and you have a consistency between them. That, and what happens is that the, the same mechanism that was used on semi-supervised semi learning uh, will make those models to improve each other during the training. And then uh, it, uh, what this model will do is to uh, shift this, 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 this model prediction towards these decision boundaries of the target domain. Uh, the experimentation split here is a, is a little different than the, the splits that we usually do in supervised learning. So we, we have the training set that where we have center one and two data, and we have the inputs and labels for this data. And uh, we also have the validation set where we have input and labels. And we also have a pool of unlabeled data where you don't have labels, right? So what you do to evaluate this model, you train on center one and two, and then you do adaptation on this unlabeled data and you verify how your model performs here. And the same for the test set, which is just a set that you, uh, you book your performance at the end of uh, doing this, uh, this training and hyperparameter selection. Uh, so those are the results uh, for center three and four. So what happens here is that our model was trained on center one and two, and then we evaluated our model on center three and four by adapting it to center three or four, right? So we can see here uh, the baseline, which is just a supervised baseline that was trained also on model on uh, center one and two. And this baseline was, uh, has exactly the same architecture of uh, the model that we use the, on the mean teacher. So when we compare here the performance of the baseline with the one that did an adaptation on center three, we can see that there's uh, a improvement of two points in the dice when the, for the model that uses unlabeled data, right? So this is also kind of a free improvement because you're just using unlabeled data. And this is the same for center four. The center four was uh, a much higher improvement. It went from 69 to 74 in the dice. So it's a very quite good improvement. And uh, we also saw that uh, this adaptation on other domains, if they are applied on similar domains, it can also improve a little. So it went like for center four, it went from the baseline here for uh, up to uh, 84 if you adapt for different centers. Uh, so, to, to summarize the conclusion is just that deep learning can indeed significantly improve in the traditional segmentation methods, even when we compare to the unit that was, that is one of the very traditional methods that are used. 
uh, is now data regime is very challenging because we don't have huge pools of data to do pre-training of our model. And uh, however, semi-supervised learning showed that it's a it's promising avenue to do that. And this, the, the only issue is that almost nobody's working with that for segmentation. So this is uh, it's very difficult to find a method that, that will work well with segmentation. Uh, and uh, variability in medical imaging breaks uh, one of the most fundamental assumptions that we have, which is this uh, domain shift, right? It, it, it violates the empirical, the assumptions that empirical risk minimization assumes. So it causes a lot of problems in reality. And uh, we show it that we, by just using a label that they're using a supervised domain adaptation, we can improve uh, on, those, uh, on those supervised baselines just by using uh, unlabeled data. Uh, so next steps, there's an ongoing project that is, uh, is working on uh, informing MRI, uh, informing machine learning models with MRI parameters. Uh, this ongoing project that is, is, is being developed now. Uh, also, other ways to improve those modeling is, is to try to increase the inductive bias for segmentation. Sometimes we have a rota small rotation in the, in, the, in, this, in the gray matter or the spinal cord. Sometimes it's twisted when it's scanned, especially on ex vivo. And uh, if we can add those, uh, uh, those biases in the model itself, it will certainly provide better results. Uh, another uh, research that should be very interesting is to add the spatial priors on CNNs because we know that the, uh, the gray matter have uh, this specifically uh, butterfly shape. However, this is, is very difficult to add this prior on CNN. So this is also a very interesting uh, thing to research. And the uh, proper uncertainty qu quantification is also very interesting and it's also very uh, interesting for active learning because on active learning then you start to be more data efficient, so you need less labels to have a better model. So it's very interesting, and it's also related to the semi-supervised learning. Uh, uh, but it, because in the end, what you have is that, of course, that more data is always better than better models. Uh, but the issue is that better data is always better than just more data, right? And this is the the point of uh, the entire point of active learning. Right? Uh, those are the publications during the, this uh, master's research. Uh, it was, uh, the first paper was on scientific reports and another conference on Mikai, then later uh, on NIPS as well, on the medical image workshop, and then the, on the editorial and two collaborations with uh, people from the lab. On the, the first one was uh, with Duke University on post-mortem ex vivo, uh, on post-mortem uh, MRI of the entire cord, and uh, an another one together with uh, Aldo and the uh, Axon Dipsec for segmenting microscopy of uh, myelin. Uh, so thanks for all the friendship of everyone. Uh, if I forgot to put your name here, <laughs> uh, you were probably on my thesis as well. <laughs> so uh, thanks a lot for everyone that helped me since the day zero when I arrived here in Montreal. And uh, those are just the references, question and, and question. Thanks everyone again. I will be happy to answer any questions that might have. All right, so thank you, Christian. And uh, I want to make sure that um, you know, everybody is on the call. I know that uh, Max Wabartha was trying to join. Is he on the call right now? Yeah, yeah he is. OK, perfect. Excellent. Uh, so uh, I think this wraps up the official uh, presentation from Christian. Uh, and now it's time for questions. Uh, we'll start with Pierre who is uh, the jury member. Then we'll go with Ian, and I will ask the last round. Is that, does that sound like a plan? Yeah, absolutely. Do you have guidelines about uh, timing for questions? <laughs> Not really. I think we all want to be done in about an you know, hour and a half more, but uh, no pressure. No, we can, we can take our time. <laughs> all right. So thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, really uh, enjoyed the presentation. I'm going to start just like by saying that I um, really think that what you're working on is important. Mm -hmm. This idea of, of domain adaptation in particular, at the end of the day, you want to be able to release algorithm and they work. And um, very few people evaluate things. You know, they typically try on their data set, which you know, nobody really cares about at the end of the day. That's people right. care about their data, not your data. 
uh, <laughs> and uh, I mean, you say that multiple times in your in your report, and I mm -hmm. believe it's true. It's not been looked at nearly enough. I mean, probably just because of, of data availability, which requires to, to have a large collection of data. So it's uh, an issue that's very close to my heart. So you know, I, I really uh, appreciated um, uh, fo following uh, your work on this front. Other uh, aspect I want to stress is that this was very clearly written, uh, very high quality, and in the sense that I only have one uh, typo I cut. I'm not a very attentive <laughs> guy, but still, you know, I, I usually catch more than that. So it's, it's a testimony to uh, you putting efforts in polishing this work. Uh, something that struck me is how you, you always draw a parallel between uh, very theoretical motivations like the way you introduce the domain adaptation through uh, um, empirical um, risk minimization. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I can tell you from a technical background, but it's, uh, it's refreshing because it's actually not common the, in the field, right? To, to sort of have this constant interplay between a very theoretical high level motivation and, and your uh, uh, experience on, on real data set and it's probably something we, we, need, we need more as gu gu guiding principles. So it was kind of a signature move during your whole report, which I really enjoy. Uh, okay, so I, I think I mean I, I've got a few a few more uh, praise in there. Um, I, but yeah, I mean you you do have very thorough evaluation in there, which is also uh, very atypical in general and in particular for master thesis. So I wanted to just like uh, start by acknowledging how much work is going in there and how impressive it is. Uh, as I said to uh, Julien, uh, discussing originally your work, that this is more like a, a doctoral thesis, uh, I, would, I would say, in terms of the amount of work Thank you're presenting. So anyway, um, that, that was just like preliminary, starting with the good stuff. Now, I do have a number of questions <laughs> for you still. Um, so I guess, let, let's start right at it. One of the things that most concern me is that you've got some some a, a lot of sentences in your report. I've got a, a, a specific example, page 52, mm -hmm. um, where you're saying, oh, I, I chose that architecture because that's what worked. You know, you had a couple of, 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 of okay. uh, I haven't noted the exact quote. I just noted it happened on mm -hmm. page 52. Um, how many things did you try? out of the things you report. Yeah, so, yeah, this is something that never goes out in papers, yeah. but uh, it's interesting, it's a very good question. Uh, we tried a lot of things, we tried a lot of things, we even tried GANs to do domain adaptation, uh, but in the end, uh, we have also discussion in meetings with people from Mila. The problem is that you always have uh, a very small amount of data, and uh -huh. this is very problematic for GANs, right? Because yeah. they model, in the end, they, they end up modeling just the data distribution that is there. There's yep. nothing new in the, uh -huh. in the data that they generate. So if you use this data to augment your data set, it does not change anything in the results. So we tried a lot of things. We tried to use GANs to do that. We tried to use GANs to augment the data set. We tried to condition on, to condition the GANs in some uh, interpolation of the mask. Uh, we also tried uh, out encoders to try to include the priors that mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier to see if it improves the models. But in the end, what work it really well, I would say it was the dilated convolutions. They work they work really well on this on this on this supervised uh, framework. Yeah. And the domain adaptation was very nice to see that uh, it worked really well with just adding a small amount of data. The difficulty on expanding this was just because when you have the consistency loss and you do data augmentation, if you change, if you rotate on the data documentation, you have to rotate all those two masks mm -hmm. because you are doing consistent between them, so yeah. they have to be aligned. This was one of the most difficult parts of expanding this for segmentation because mm -hmm. everyone does this for classification, right? You just do for classification, you don't have, you don't have to worry about yeah. masks and anything. It's very easy. But when you go to segmentation, this is one problem. So we tried many different things. Okay. So I mean, because you know, there what you report is mm -hmm. about a five percent increase in your dice. Mm -hmm. Well. You know, no, 0.05 increase in the dice mm -hmm. cost. Uh, so how can it be overfitting if you've tried so many things? Uh, I mean, you, you tried only on that one. That we I tried think. it, but uh, what is good about the data set that we use it is that it, uh, the test set, we don't have labels for it. It's a, it's a holdout that is uh, from the challenge. So okay. to do to do um, evaluation on that, you you do you create your 
prediction masks. You, you we did like training and validation, of course, to do mm -hmm. the the selection of parameters, yep. and then you submit to the system. The system evaluates and give you the reports. But how many uh, submissions did you do? Uh, we did four, I think. Okay. Which is okay. I, I don't think it's overfitting because if it would be overfitting, uh, we will have a lot of trouble in the test set and. Uh, we also see this problem in the SCT, right? Because we use a spinal cord box to segment other volumes, and we see that it's working well. So I don't think it's overfitting. I, I mean, I, I don't know if you're aware of that, but it is a problem in machine. In yeah, yeah, in no, general. no, yeah, yeah. Like, it's a very even huge when you problem. have all the test data, there's so many groups mm -hmm. and so many things being tried that the right. they don't generalize, and the smaller your data set, the yeah. bigger the problem. And here you have what, 80. We had uh, 80 subjects, eight, eight, eight. which is, I would say that's a lot of data for a case because we regularize a lot of the network. We use a very small network. And then it was, we did a 2D Excel uh, training. So it was like almost 2,000 slices. So it's reasonable. For the, for the segment, for the supervised way, uh, on, this, on the domain adaptation is different because as you said, you know, like even the challenge was not, a, they didn't have a proper uh, data split for evaluating uh, domain adaptation because they, what they usually do is that everyone trains on the center from four uh, on the data from four centers, right? So, mm -hmm. and then later you try to evaluate your model on those four same centers, right? Even though it's is not the same subject, it's still the same center. So, in the domain adaptation, we changed this. Okay, uh, so that makes a, a great transition for my next question. Do, mm -hmm. do you think it's that bad? Say, so if you had thirty centers, mm -hmm. do you think that really trying to do domain adaptation from 29 to 1 uh -huh. would work better than just training on the full 30 and see what happens on 30, 31. The problem is that if you do that, you are assuming that you have label data for mm -hmm. the for the L centers, right? If you have yeah. label data, indeed, you should use this data, right? But the problem is that we have this in our lab a lot of uh, the, the, the centers they send data, but they don't send labels, right? That's the that's the main problem. So the main point of the you can do there's many ways of doing this on adaptation. The way that we choose was the unsupervised way, which you don't assume that you have labels. Right? So it's a very specific scenario. So I, let, let me rephrase my question. Uh -huh. uh, assuming you have labels for everyone, okay. you, you still draw a, a clear distinction between basically two ways of quality validating. Mm -hmm. One, say you have four centers, you're going to okay. train on three, and you're going to test on the fourth. So okay. You've never seen data from that center. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And that's true, you know, mm -hmm. generalization. And the second scenario, you train on four, and you test on four. Mm -hmm. And my question is, at the end of the day, by just training on very heterogeneous data, mm -hmm. don't you think that the algorithm can learn how to deal with distribution of shifts? Yes, if you have all this data, of course, that this, the problem is that this will take capacity of your model, right? So mm -hmm. it, it might work well in some cases, but there's there are some cases where it does not work well. Like, for instance, when you have multiple contrasts, this might have a problem. And uh, this was shown by the, there's a recent uh, paper from Miller, it's called a film. They are using this on GANs as well, which is a way to condition all the layers on the on the network based on some data from your data, like if it's a center or if it's a, mm -hmm. a contrast. And this helped a lot, and also in NLP, this helps a lot. So you can get, uh, you can get, uh, you can get rid of this, uh, you can partially not, not mitigate the entire problem of the adaptation, but you can partially mitigate that if you have labeled it. I agree with that. Uh, as long as you have capacity in your model, right? The model will learn how to extract this, right? But the problem is that the problem is that when you don't have label red data. So let's say that you train it on 30 centers, okay? You train your model, and your model uh, learn it how to be good on this data, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's data from another center. There's there always will be another center, another different yeah. uh, distribution, right? And this is where the problem lies. So, I, I mean, I, I only have limited experience with that. We, we try mm -hmm. to look at that in the lab, and our conclusions was when you start having highly heterogeneous training data, mm -hmm. it actually learns features that start being invariant to some of the shifts mm -hmm. that you're mm -hmm. dealing with. So at the end of the day, it's also, you know, the question if all you're dealing with is maybe a shift in mean intensity mm -hmm. and maybe a, a, a bit of a bit in smoothness, you can hope that your network is going to learn features that actually are invariant to those conditions. If you have if you have data, I would say that yes, it will learn. But the problem is that, as you can see here, you see. Let me go to the. Yeah. No, I I believe that the problem. The you, problem is that when you have when you don't have a lot of data. That's That's, it. Ish, that's the concern. And, and I think it's really critical, probably, in the type of regime you're describing here, exactly. when you have only a exactly. few centers. Yeah, no, that's, true, that's, centers. that's true. I'm not sure it actually will yeah. be such a big issue, and I. 
quite honestly, I mean, it's just a question. Mm -hmm. I, I think we need data to answer that question. In the limited experience I have, mm -hmm. actually throwing more heterogeneous data. So no, it, uh, I, I completely agree with that. If you have more data and this data, there's a huge variability in your data, yeah. the models will learn to overcome that. The problem okay. is when you, when you have different data on those uh, small data regimes, which is often the, 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 the regime that we are, we don't have like a image net to train. Mm -hmm. We don't have like a 100 patients to take with gray matter segmented and all like This is, but I agree. If you have data and it's heterogeneous and data, you, and can you have capacity in your model. And you have capacity in your model. Then potentially you're good to go. Enter. All right. Excellent. Okay, excellent. So uh, other questions I had, maybe kind of clarification of things I, I didn't understand, or maybe like, when you motivated the, the semi-supervised learning algorithm, mm -hmm. it's like an exponential moving average mm -hmm. uh, teacher model. Mm -hmm. um, you said, all right, I have my two points. I need to separate them. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's just two points. There's lots of hyperplanes I can draw. Mm -hmm. But if I know that two, two points belong to clusters, then you know, assuming that the cluster generates a label, I can, I can you know, mm -hmm. leverage that and do sort of cluster-based prediction mm -hmm. rather than just those points. I think that's a great motivation, but I don't think that that's what you're doing at all. I'm on, only understanding mm -hmm. parts of the algorithm, though, so maybe okay. just, yeah, I, I don't mm -hmm. understand it. But from what I see, essentially what you do is that you mess with the data, you introduce perturbations, Gaussian noise, yeah, some, some ro as well. rotation. And rotations and translations. OK, drop out, you, you, you get rid of parts of the image. Drop out, you just, you create like, a, is inside of the network? Inside of you, the you network. You create a, like yeah. a, a lot of uh, blind spots. Yeah, 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 all right. So you do drop out in the network and, and you ensure that you get consistent answers, right? Yes, yes. By consistent answers, you mean like in the, term, in the terms of consistent yeah. loss? Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that the predictions don't change too much if you apply some perturbation on your inputs and networks. Is that? The predictions, fair. sorry, but uh, so can you... F of x theta and F uh -huh. of x theta prime uh -huh. are just two different predictions yes. mm -hmm. from your data, mm -hmm. except that you have slightly different parameters and potentially also the, the, you, you, you've, you've augmented the data set, so you're changing your input uh -huh. themselves. Yeah, yeah, I got the question. So th th there's two main things happening here. The first one is that you use a data augmentation, right? Yeah. So this is one thing. And the data augmentation is different for those models, for those two models. Okay. The parameters of data augmentation are different. So let's say that here you rotate to the right and that you rotate to the left. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but so in the end, you messed a little bit with the data, but yeah. you, exactly. you think that fundamentally those perturbations should not change your label. But that's your underlying assumption. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's perturbations that does not change labels. Yeah. The labels are always the same. You do data augmentation on the input, you do the exactly same augmentation in the label, right? Yeah. So this is, uh, this will introduce some uh, invariance. It will make the student to learn from the teacher. Also, it will learn from the teacher and it will learn to be invariant to those transformations, yeah. right? So it, it will provide a, an extra generalization, right? Okay. So this is the, uh, the data augmentation part. There's another part, which is uh, this exponential moving average. Right? So this exponential moving average is just an average of the weights through yeah. the training. And this is a self called Poliak averaging, and uh, there is a theory that proves that it's always a little better than okay. they they do when they participate on challenge like on uh, ImageNet and things. They, uh -huh. they always do this because it gives an extra boost. Okay, so this model will be always a little better than this one. Okay, okay. so what happens is that this model is here, right? So this model, let's say, this is here in the space of uh, of of, uh, of parameters, right? So this model is here, and this is the student, right? This is the teacher. So the teacher is always a little better than this one, and the teacher will follow this, okay? Yeah. Then later, if you average this one, and this one will be a little better, and then this one will go. So it's a, it's a virtual cycle. They should, they should converge. They will converge. They will yeah. convert at some point. And what's the motivation for doing that? Like, I understand the augmentation part, mm -hmm. although we, we need to uh -huh. maybe chat okay. a little bit more about it, but, but what's the motivation of the teacher part? So the teacher part is because of this exponential moving average, because when you make like one model follow the other, they are kind of improving each other, okay, uh, yeah. during the training. But the point is that you, by doing that, you open the channel to unlabel data. This is mainly to open the ch this channel to feed unlabel data. Otherwise, you won't be able to feed this. Well, yes and no. I guess you could very easily imagine that you know you would have one model you're training, okay, and you would enforce that model to give consistent answer uh -huh. if you did oh, independent of rotations in, in, 
but the, but then if you just use so this is the, the traditional can, model right this is just the supervised training let's yeah. say okay but you needed the, the label data to do well, this loss here right no like yeah. How, how would you compute your loss? Because you cannot compute this loss here without the, the, the control. Yeah, well, you, you wouldn't be able to compute the, the loss uh -huh. on, the, on the supervised aspect, but you could still have a loss for the consistency aspect and, uh, yes. and the, modify your parameters. That, 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 that is a good point, and we actually did an ablation of this because we, uh, we thought that, well, okay, uh, you might argue that uh, the, the improvement is not coming from this, but from the, yeah. the, the average, right? So we did an ablation of that, and uh, we showed that it, it had the same results as the baseline. The only moment where it improved it's where we in, uh, we added in label data. So we did an ablation be exactly because of this question. Because this was, uh, you, you, you may argue that, oh, you, you're doing averaging here. So of course, it, that if you compare this averaging with the, the model that don't have averaging, it will be a little better, right? Well, so I guess from what I understand, the averaging part is kind of a trick to improve the convergence of the model, the training of the model. And your ablation yes. experiment was like, mm -hmm. Is all my improvement coming from that tree? Yes. But my question is, is all your improvement co coming from just like ensuring consistency to perturbation? And that you, I mean, you, you could perturbate the, the same model, like you don't need to have a, a separate teacher model. And no, and, and we do that. The baseline is like this. We okay. perturb, uh, we, we, this is exactly the same data documentation okay. that we perform here is the same that we perform in the baseline. So the baseline model is exactly the same model here and the same perturbations, the same upper parameter, same everything. And the only difference here is that you include, you have the duplication of that model, which is, it's the same model in the end. And uh, you have unlabeled data here. So we show that it's really unlabeled data that's causing improvement. Yeah. Because if you just leave the exponential moving average or if you just use a baseline with data augmentation, you will have the results of the baseline, yeah. which is uh, always a little worse than by adding this, this data here, you see the baseline here, for instance, and adapted to center four is goes from seven nine to seven four. Yeah. If we do just the baseline with the exponential moving average, it, it, it gets a little better, like six nine, almost seventy, but never goes to this uh, uh -huh. to this threshold here. Okay. Actually, have you tested statistically those differences? We did. Uh, we did now for because this uh, this is a paper that's submitted in our image and reviewers ask it for uh, some uh, statistical significant uh -huh. testing and we did for the for the ablation not for those results in the ablation it was uh, statistically significant for some uh, for some uh, metrics but not for all not yeah. for all okay. but uh, there's also another thing here because if you look at the let me see here. Oh, it's, it, sorry, it's not here. There's another result that shows the difference of the variance of those models. Because since you are doing this, uh, this averaging of the, the model, like an mean teacher here, let me see if I have results here. So here you see that the, the, the variance on semi supervised learning, uh, almost for all metrics, are always smaller. You see? So it's also, it's not, it, it does not provide a little better results, but it reduces the variance of the, of the errors as well. Because you're doing this averaging the parameters of the model. Okay, okay, okay. So, the answers, I, I, <laughs> the yeah. second post has been a bit uh, yeah, sort no of problem. like uh, uh, long, but going back to what I was saying mm -hmm. initially, so we would agree that what gives the boost in performance here mm -hmm. is ultimately the, the augmentation part with uh, uh, unlabeled data. With unlabeled data. With unlabeled, with unlabeled data. data. So, would you say that what you're doing is that you have one? Thinking back to that schematic where you have just like one white dot and one black dot, mm -hmm. would it be fair to say that you're trying to move the mm -hmm. white dot around and make sure that your prediction is not going to change in this neighborhood from a different data set? Uh, so you are in this case here, you are adapting. Uh, let me go to this yeah, image, right? That, so, image, yes. so what you are, what we are doing here is that you, your model is basically is starting to see those points that are close yeah. to this one. This is what they call label propagation because you are propagating the label yeah. of this one to the, to the neighbors, right? So what happens is that the model starts to, uh, to be, uh, to aggregate all those, uh, it starts to see all those unlabeled data as if they were, they had this label. Yeah. yeah. During the training, this, this is what happened. Okay, so, but that happens through some kind of a local augment and feeding those extra points? And uh, no, it, it happened, it, it, there's a complication in that because 
this is uh, uh, when you do that, it's called the what's called the mm, mm, you are doing this label propagation. But the difference uh, when you have this deep learning model is that the model will be adapting, and the model will is the model that will provide that it will change to say that this one is close to this one. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, I mean it's so it's, there's it's a complication. It's iterative. Yeah, it's, it's iterative. iterative. It's iterative. Process, it's process, and, yeah. But what you hope then is that through this propagation of local mm -hmm. affinities, let's mm -hmm. say. You're going to end up discovering cluster. Exactly. I mean, that's how DB scan works. Exactly. And the but the main the main motivation for extending from go, going from the semi supervised learning to the domain adaptation with the same technique is that if you do semi supervised learning with uh, with unlabeled data that is from a very different domain, the actual results are worse in semi supervised learning. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, one reason why it's good for domain adaptation. Because it is, you see that when you fit the very different data, it is changing the, the this this uh, this uh, decision boundary towards the unlabeled data, right? So if you have a very different data set, it gives worse results for you on, on semi-supervised learning. But this is good for the adaptation, right? Because you are adapting for the unlabeled data. Yeah. This is one of the main motivations to go from uh, semi-supervised learning for the adaptation with the same technique. Okay. And uh, okay. Uh, I mean, we can maybe have another round of questions later, but uh, just one uh, last one. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you could try to actually help for uh, domain generalization through your augmentation step? Understanding that here you've done something really basic, like you just move the you data can. around mm -hmm. and you, you add a bit of noise, mm -hmm. but could you have like shifted your statistical properties, adjusted the contrast? You if can, that's what you think is uh -huh. happening when you change mm -hmm. center, couldn't you like simulate that? You can do that, and we try to do many of those things. I, even on this, those models, we do also. Uh, there's a lot of data documentation going on here. We also do like uh, shifting the, the intensities. We shift yeah. the intensities. We add noise. We add rotation. And we do elastic transformation. You do a lot of data documentation, but it helps up to a point because okay. you need. If you want to be to get good results, you need those augmentations to be very realistic to what happens uh -huh. in the real life, right? And it's very difficult to come with those transformations by hand, you see? So it's a matter of how creative you can get on creating data augmentations versus mm -hmm. letting the model do it alone, you know? That is the main difference. I would say that if you know how to make those uh, those images to look, if you have different contrasts, you know, have a different machine, but if you know how to pre-process them to make them look very similar, then it, you should do that, right? But the issue is that you can do that at, at a certain, up to a certain level, right? You can, it's very difficult to, to do this kind of pre-processing nowadays. Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. Even, I mean, I work with EPI gold data mm -hmm. and I still have really no clue where those multicentric differences come, even though I pretty aggressively try to understand which parameters are actually driving differences. I still don't really know why you have to shift in distribution. Anyway, uh, that's good for me. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Pierre. So mm -hmm. next we'll go to Julien. All right. So, um, well, so I'll start by saying that, uh, as, as Pierre said, this is brilliant work. Um, if everybody in the room you know, knows that this is brilliant work, uh, you know that this is brilliant work. So uh, I don't think that, you know, that there's much to say there. What I want to say is, is thank you for uh, what, what you, you know, brought to, to the lab. It's, it's huge. Um, not only, you know, uh, the very careful methods uh, in what you implemented, but you've also helped uh, many of your colleagues, and so, this is extremely appreciated. Thank you. And you you well, you helped them, you know, with like, uh, <laughs> you know, good, uh, you know, with, um, confidence, but also with with uh, humility uh, and, and patience. Yeah, this is this is a good model. Thanks, Alex. Um, <laughs> so uh, I guess. So my questions would be more on the, um, on the you know what what to do next. So for mm -hmm. example, uh, you know you 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 started working on the dilated convolution, mm -hmm. and then you showed that this is actually better than the simple unit. Mm -hmm. Then you came back to the unit for you know uh, mm -hmm. some supervised and adaptation just mm -hmm. because this is the state of the art and, mm -hmm. and, and it's quite popular. 
But do you think that uh, in next step we should just use uh, that conversion for all our simulation yeah. work and combine that with the uh, mm -hmm. supervised uh, learning, for example? Uh -huh. Yeah, I think that uh, the reason why we use the units here in those two works is because if we didn't use it, the, the unit reviewers would say, oh, please use the unit because it's the most used model, so we have to compare it with the unit, right? But in my opinion, we should definitely start using the, the dynamic convolutions because they clearly show better results. And they are more, uh, you know, is, is a more uh, simple architecture compared to the unit. And for instance, when we compare the results of the dilated convolutions with the unit, it, uh, for the unit to get close to the, the, to the same result, it has to be, it, it needs to have six times more parameters than the, the network from the dilated convolution. So it's, it's more parameter efficient and it's, better, it's a little slower because it takes more memory, of course. But it's, it, the results that I saw are always better than the unit. And I try many, many, many different uh, architectures and uh, I change a lot in the unit. And uh, we also found that, you know, in the unit, when you have the bottom of uh, the unit, because the network has some shortcuts, the, the, the U, right, and they have some shortcuts here, uh, we found that if you change, uh, like, uh, if you remove the layers in the bottom, the, the, the network gave, gave the same results. So it shows that the, the bottom of the network is almost useless for, uh, for a lot of uh, segmentation tests. So I would say that definitely the, the, this architecture on the dilated convolutions is much better. It's, much well formalized it and uh, in the end give better results. So this is what many. So to play the devil's advocate and also okay. in, in relation to one of the first slides that you showed mm -hmm. to present the difference between machine learning and, and the specific of deep learning, which okay. is to remove the uh, feature engineering. Mm -hmm. You know, one could argue that you know when you design um, the deep learning architecture and mm -hmm. when you train it, you do need uh, some knowledge expert. Yeah, that's uh, so true. I don't see the expert on the point, doing that, uh, but I think it's wrong. You you do need some expertise. Yeah. Uh, Maybe not on the domain of data, but on the domain of the network, right? Exactly. Exactly. That's that's Thank critical. You. And so, in relation to, to that comment, if we come back to the um, you know to the data conversion, you, you know you present some advantages of that and the mm -hmm. fact that you know the unit has you know more parameters. But in fact, if we were to uh, Feature engineer the, the dilated convolution mm -hmm. uh, or the unit as well as you did for the dilated convolution. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that we might end up, you know, similar? Um, yeah, there's some people that use the dilated convolutions on the unit and they, it gives some uh, good results, but I never saw a comparison uh, with the dilated convolutions on the unit with this, uh, with this, 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 this network with deep lab. And this, uh, the good part of this. Uh, the good part of this architecture is that uh, this was proven to be uh, the best architecture on a challenge where there was a lot of different labs working on it. So there's like more than 30, 40 labs working on that. And this was the, 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 the best one architecture, the deep lab, right, which is from Google. The difference here is that we removed pulling. So uh, I would say that if the unit was able to reach a point where it can get good results by using the latent convolutions, uh, I'm pretty sure that this, this network would be on, the, on this ranking, right? Mm. So because, because it's the most, uh, it's the most uh, natural evolution, and there was people that tried that, but it, it never went to a ranking like this. Yeah, but then, based on the graph that we saw with the, with the little box that says experts, you know, maybe by, you know, maybe. <laughs> featuring, you know, in the, in the best possible way, the unit we might uh, get. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it will get better, but in the end, there, there will still be the problems, you know, like of the bottom of the unit, where mm -hmm. you have problems with the gradients, there is also this, this, uh, mm -hmm. this problem will continue the same in no a matter if you use a uh, dilated convolution. So or it not. could be argued by, by removing some, some layers. It can be, but you will always have the shortcuts on top, and it means that uh, it does not matter how much capacity you add your network. In, in the end, the bottom will have trouble to learn. You know, that's the, that's one one of the issues of the unit. Um, so, I, in the in the um, conclusion of the uh, domain adaptation, you, you you mentioned that uh, training with unable um, mm -hmm. data can introduce some problem. Uh, can you elaborate? Yes. On, yes. On so uh, the problem is when you, we say that uh, most people say unsupervised domain adaptation because you assume that there is like zero labels in the, in the target domain, right? But the issue is that on practical scenarios, you, let's say you adapt your model to this unlabeled data, right? And then you segment this data. How would you know that it is better or not, right? So in the end, in the real scenario, you still need some labels. Of course, you don't need a lot of labels, mm -hmm. but you need some labels. And another problem that we found is that you need to choose uh, hyperparameters of this network, right? And then you choose hyperparameters on your validation 
set, which is which might be different, and which is it is different to the target domain that you on the test set, right? So uh, we found that the, the choice of hyperparameters are robust enough to still give some uh, uh, increasing of the results. But I would because say, the, mm -hmm. they are the same hyperparameters. Yeah, the, the, the same parameters that was found on center three are used on center four. So you don't, uh, the center four is the test set. So you cannot pick on that. Uh, you cannot look at this data when you are training or evaluating, right? So you choose your data on center three, uh, your, your hyperparameters on the data from center three. But uh, if they differ a lot, you might not have this improvement, you see? So it's always better. And it's also a real scenario that you will still have some, uh, some labels from your center, side, you, from the target domain. So this is one of the problems that arise in all like use. Even though you say that's unsupervised, in the end, in the practical scenario, you still will need some uh, label data to know if you, you know, like if you are improving or not, right? Otherwise, you are doing just a training on the blind. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, you mentioned that uh, also in the conclusion that um, some special priors could be added from mm -hmm. the, on the CNN. Uh, how 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 do you think that's, that that could be done? Yeah, this is uh, this is a very difficult problem on CNNs. I would say that you know, like one way to do that maybe is uh, trying to work on pre-processing, maybe. But it's it's very difficult. I tried to use autoencoders. There's only one work that I found that uh, was uh, doing that, and they used uh, an autoencoder to encode the label. So they just uh, feed the uh, input the labels, labels itself, not the data, the labels in autoencoder. And they created like features of this, and then they regularized the, the network with those features. It's also one way to do that. However, I implemented the paper. It took a lot of time to implement the paper, and I did get very good results. So I would say that this is still an open question. You know, it's still an open question. It's very difficult. To do. And when you pre-processing, you mean like, for example, by field correction? On the no, I mean uh, on the post-processing. You can do post-processing. When you have the label, right? And in mm -hmm. some way, you try to regularize this output to be close to the, the butterfly shape. Right? So it's one way to do that. But the issue is that it's always shifting. You know, is it, the, the butterfly shape is not always the same. It is translating, it's rotating. So in Bayesian framework, it's very easy to do those kind of things, but like on this uh, on frequencies on CNN, this is, is almost uh, very difficult to, mm. to say to them because the, in the end of the every every point in the segmentation prediction is based on a huge receptive field in the input, right? And this changes if you change in the output, it, this field it, this receptive field is changing. So every point in the end is is, is an independent prediction, right? So you you are not taking consideration the, the set of predictions. You're not in consideration like one pixel that are neighbor to the other has more chance to be uh, from the gray matter, right? So if it's closer to the to the uh, huge blob of gray, gray matter, but this is not being taken in consideration for the network, and this is something that uh, and the, the 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 challenge is how to add this in the network. That is the real challenge. Um, and maybe like a more like a global. Um, Questions of a, like a strategical question of you know how how to now, now that you know we have um, we have all those tools um, what do you think would be a best strategy for for a lab to uh, maintain you know, some like deep learning based uh, you know, tools for mm -hmm. segmentations for example do you think uh, a strategy could be for example to um, so you know we have like a model that kind of works mm -hmm. uh, then we keep receiving data. Mm -hmm. From uh, people of all over the world, and we could do, for example, uh, you know, unsupervised domain adaptation, mm -hmm. update the model, mm -hmm. um, and then just keep going for mm -hmm. years. The pro I mean, one of the potential problems with updating the model, which is that you know what you show here, is that you do tests on the on the on the external domain, right? Yeah. So I guess a you know, question for you would be how how to deal with that in the in the the unknown of the Yeah, that's the issue. I would say that you know, if you if you can just have like a small portion of label data to do uh, a at least a compute some metrics on it, it will help, you know, because then you will know that it's adapting and uh, it's improving, right? Because otherwise it will be uh, like I said, if you're doing like blind training. But I would say that you know like the, the best architecture to that is to is to have your supervised training, right? You have uh, you receive data and you have sometimes you have label data. So add this and retrain the model, right? So you, there's no way to escape from retraining the model. 
you always need to return the model even if it's unlabeled data. Uh, and so you train your model with this label data and you do you make sure that it's getting good results for this label data. And then later you do, you, once you have an architecture and now hyperparameters, and then you do, you add this component here of the, of the domain adaptation, right? Then you start because you, then you will know that this work, this model is working fine for the data that you have. And then later you can add unlabeled data and retrain this model by duplicating this model and using the same hyperparameters because then you will know that this will work. It's, it's a way to, to, to be sure that it is at least will have some after the, uh, at least able to have the same result that you had before or better and not worse, right? Um, okay, because they are the same hyperparameters. Exactly, we use the same hyperparameters, same regularization, right? So it will adapt to this uh, to this model. But the issue that with domain adaptation is that you know like you are adapting to a target domain. It might not mean that after adaptation you will still have the good performance on the tar on the source domain. Exactly. That's and one problem. That's, yeah. that's needed, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that, that's another problem so because I guess having like yeah. a test set you need, like all yeah. the variety of data that yeah, is just that's like true. A, populating this and populating uh, it. I would say that's one good approach to do that. Cool, cool. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Julia. So uh, question, I will follow up with um, some of uh, the methodological questions that were already raised uh, and maybe just try to get a couple of uh, numbers slash hunches, guesses from you. Uh, I realize that, you know, you're working with a very diverse data set. Honestly, I was very surprised when I saw how widely the uh, signal varies between these four data sets that you use for domain adaptation. Uh, and I also know that you did some uh, post-processing to make sure that the uh, images look as close to each other as possible. For example, you did uh, an upsampling of some of the data sets from 50 to 25 microns. Is that correct? Yes. yes 100 yes. to 250. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so can you comment a little bit on how that affects some of your uh, uh, experimental choices, in particular, assuming that these data sets had different SNR, given the difference in the uh, voxel size. Mm -hmm, yeah. So that's true, yeah. Uh, one problem that we had is that there's four different centers and they have different resolutions, right? So this was uh, the voxel size, the physical voxel size is different between them. So what we did was to, we had to resample, right? Because those networks, they are not a uh, scale invariant, right? You need all the input data to be on the same scale uh, to, for this model to generalize. Of course, that this model will be invariant to some uh, degrees of uh, scaling, but uh, you, you know, like the amount of scaling that we see on this is uh, it's very difficult for the model to adapt. So what we did was to resample everything to the best resolution that we had, which was the 0 0.5 uh, millimeters. Right? And then uh, after doing this resampling, uh, it, it, it is something that you, you have to be a price for that, right? Because if you resample any volume and uh, at the end, uh, on the prediction of the network, you have to resample the prediction of the network as well, right? To match the original input size. And uh, when you do that, you might have to upsample and by upsampling, you are just uh, using a method like that takes nearest neighbors or, or bilinear interpolation, right? So you are creating data and this is, when you create this data at the end, it, this data is not learned. So the network is not learning how to uh, upsample to this original domain. So uh, this, this I would say that this, this comes uh, with a price of performance, of course, but I don't see any other way of, of, of uh, overcoming this because one way that you can might, uh, you can might try to, to overcome this is to train a model for different resolutions, but then you have less data to train one model. So you have to use just a part of your data to train one model and then part of data to train another model. And features, the, 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 those two models won't communicate with each other and they won't share features that they learned from different data, right? So I would say that this, this is one problem that's a, it's still an open question. There's, there's, no, there's work that was yeah, made. So, you're, so okay? you're saying it's, it's a necessary evil. Uh, you know, we, we, we have to somehow make sure that we compare apples to apples. Exactly. Now, I, I want to, to take this a little further and maybe put it in the context of um, your choices for domain adaptation. So uh, figure 6.2 in your thesis, and I think you also showed it in your presentation, it's the axial slice pixel intensity distribution from the four different centers. Mm 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you pull that up? Yeah, right there. Uh, so, do you know which of these got upsampled uh, and which ones were kept at the original resolution? Ah, uh, that's a good question. I think, I think there was just one center that had the original resolution, that, which was zero dot twenty five. Mm -hmm. Others was uh, zero, uh, zero 05 and zero, zero 07 or something like this. But they right, are, right. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't because, know which one is which. Uh. Yeah, because, you know, the, that upsampling means also a big difference in SNR. You actually have, you know, a, a, a factor of four SNR between these sites. And then when you chose your domain adaptation, you used center one and center two for your training. Yes. And I believe you used center three for your uh, test and center four for the actual uh, center three for the validation and, and center four for the yeah. now um, why did you choose them that way uh, center one and center two are kind of in the middle there right like they seem to be the more moderate performance center yeah. four is very spread out center three is really tightly bunched between zero and four hundred yeah, yeah. your results basically you ended up with center one aligning more with uh, center four and center two aligning more with center three. Is that correct? Uh, yes, yes, that's correct, yeah. yeah. So and, we, okay. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, do you think that this choice was fortunate, informed? And what would happen if you just kind of switched things around and said, you know, how about I train on center three and center two, and then I try to adapt center one and center four, which are way out there. Now, I know that Pierre rose that issue of if you had 30, probably it wouldn't be as noticeable, but it seems like your choice was particular, and I just want to know why you made that choice. Yeah, so just uh, we didn't saw those things before, so it was mainly this, this uh, choice was basically just a random choice, not random, because we just say that, oh, let's use center one and two and three and four for, for validation and testing, right? <laughs> Uh, and we saw that there was those uh, those major differences uh, most late, later, so it was mainly just a random choice of centers. However, uh, uh, this was also pointed by one reviewer, and I think that uh, we we sh uh, one thing that uh, we can expand this would be to try to do a kind of a K fold cross validation, but mm -hmm. use different uh, mixing the centers, right? But the issue of doing that is that you also you have to choose the hyperparameters, and then there's this problem of the domain target that you don't have labels, uh, and then you have the, the validation. So it's a, the problem is more practical aspect of how to do this evaluation. And uh, yeah, this is uh, this is something that might change the results, you know, because if you change uh, some centers, you might get uh, uh, worse or better results than this. It's very difficult to say how it would be, because if you look like, for instance, here, uh, when we compare the center three and four, we have different different ranges of improvement, right? Because on center three, we, we went from 82 to 84, and on center four, we went to 69 to 74. So uh, this improvement was higher on center four than on center three. Maybe because center four might be similar to one of these, uh, in terms of the domain, it might be similar to one of the training or not. Uh, it might be because there's a lot of, it's very complex to say that because, for instance, if you think the data augmentation uh, can also play a role in there because if you have a data augmentation that uh, do some kind of uh, pre augmentation that changes the intensity of the voxels, right? Uh, what might happen is that, uh, let me go back to this image here. What might happen is that you, uh, with data augmentation, you might make uh, one, uh, the profile of intensities from one center to look more like the other. And this also might get better results when compared to one center than another, you know, so it's a... Yeah, yeah. so some kind of histogram equalization would probably bring them much closer and easier to... Uh, yeah, we, we do a normalization. So this is unnormalized, right? This is not how it's fed to the network. We do a normalization, so they become much closer to each other in terms of this, uh, those intensities. But uh, still, they are they are different. Even normalizing yeah, yeah, yeah. is different. And maybe you know, like this histogram normalization and other techniques, maybe it will improve a little. Uh, however, I would say that this, if you do like a, a, any pre-processing to improve them, uh, it will not only improve the baseline but also uh, the domain adaptation model, right? Because right, to a fair right. comparison, you need to do this augmentation on both models, right? 
Uh, and uh, I, I, I think you, you see the point that I'm driving here, which is uh, yes. mm -hmm. the, the, choices, the choices seem either uh, fortunate or well thought out. And again, I don't have enough of the information to decide, oh, you picked the low res and you trained on the low res and then you upsampled. You know, I, I just wasn't able to make that connection. Mm -hmm. But that one thing did stick out that you were actually training on the middle two histograms. And then, you know, you let the extremes kind of be the, adapt the adaptation part, which uh, again, is, is a fair enough choice and you know, nobody would question. But mm -hmm. if I saw more permutations or at least more analysis of why certain results turned out that way, it mm -hmm. would have been easier for me to get some intuition on how these networks work. Now, given yeah. that you know how they work, I imagine you can you know, kind of get a hunch here. Mm -hmm. What do you think would have happened if I were training on you know, the lowest SNR uh, as one, as, as, the, as the first training set and mm -hmm. on the most bunched up one as the second data set, assuming they weren't the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you generalize to the other, uh, do you think that that would have uh, made the results worse or you think it would have been comparable? Uh, so you mean to use the best SNR to train? Yeah, well, training? or you know, one, one way or the other, right? Like use the worst SNR to train and, you know, get, get the results as opposed to using the best SNR to train and use the worst for the uh, adaptation. Mm -hmm. So but, my, by the way, that's, that's my son. You want to say hi? So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my question, I, my, my answer, I would say that uh, it might make the models better or worse. Uh, how, how, how much of a variability do you expect you would get? I wouldn't say it would be much, you know, because okay. uh, we trained it on a supervised fashion and we didn't saw like a lot of difference on, uh, between the uh, changing centers, you know, because I think that uh, I, I wish I had put the normalized image here, but uh, after normalizing those centers uh, become very, very close to each other. Okay, right? okay. Got one, one thing that uh, uh, we also have to remember is that this is just uh, a raw histogram of intensities, right? So it's looking at intensity at every voxel independent of the others, right? So this is not a structural uh, distribution, right? So this is one part of the problem, I would say. The other part is that there's, there might be differences in the structural differences in the image itself and not and only- And you have SNR differences. The SNR differences are really key. Like you actually do have a big difference in SNR. Yeah. Yes, yes. But, uh, but I agree, you know, like if you, if you train on different set of centers. If I have chosen a, maybe a different uh, uh, set of centers to train and to evaluate, maybe it will be uh, a little different. Uh, however, this difference will be uh, most on the, on, this, uh, on the baseline and also on our model. So this, this was a, a similar point by that was raised by one, uh, one people when, when we are presenting that. And he asked that, uh, okay, but uh, what if you uh, switch centers and how would be your result, you know, uh, when you compare with the supervisor, right? I would say that, yeah, it might change your results a little, but in the end, your baseline model is never seeing the unlabeled data. So, right. and so that there is improvement by showing unlabeled data. We did ablation on that. So I would say that you might get a little better baseline, but the adaptation will always be better because you are looking at unlabeled data that is never seen by the, the supervised model. Got it. Uh, and then another observation that I think was consistent across all your tables is that uh, you, you tend to outperform the state of the art on most metrics, except the recall rate. Can you give us, us in, some intuition about that? Yes, let me go here to the supervised one. Here there's the semi-supervised, yeah. So I would say that this might be because yeah, the mean teacher model. So the, the first thing is that we use the dice loss and the dice loss is known uh, to have a very, usually a very high recall and low precision. This is one characteristic of the dice loss. So, uh, and the mean teacher, this, uh, this, this technique, it kind of regularizes the network as well. So what we think that is, uh, th that is causing this is that when we train this, uh, in this case here we have supervised and you see that the recall is not, uh, is not better here on the semi-supervised learning. Uh, and you can see that there's a change between, it looks like a mass of recall went to precision, you see? And uh, we think that this is because of this regularization that is being introduced by this, uh, by this mean, by the mean teacher method. 
So it kind of, uh, it, it, in the end, it's good because it provides us a better balanced model in terms of precision and recall, right? Uh, the recall is not that high, but you can see that the precision uh, increases, right? So this is, I would say, it's a more balanced model in terms of generalization. But, but, but in the end, I think that the, the dice is still on, uh, because precision and recall, they might be uh, um, susceptible to problems with imbalanced data, and especially when we have small tissues, small masks. I would say it's not a good measurement of uh, the performance. I would say that the dice and house dark distance are better metrics for those, those kind of, uh, of masks because the dice is overlap, right? So you have perfect overlap on one and uh, no overlap at zero, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a better intuitive way of uh, uh, checking how good is this segmentation uh, working, right? All right, thank you. So I guess I, I started with you know some of the critical points. Uh, I do want to uh, wrap this round of questions on a very positive note, which is, as Pierre said, you've you've condensed PhD level work into a hundred pages of a master's thesis. It's okay. impressive both in terms of productivity, but also in the way you write. Uh, it's a dense topic. There's lots of jargon. Some of it I'm unfamiliar with, but I never lost my train of thought. And you know I. I think you should be proud of writing something that well. And I feel proud for being able to follow it, even though I wasn't uh, ever involved in your research. So really yeah. congratulations on accomplishing that. It's, it's a remarkable feat. And uh, I hope you continue writing and blogging. You know, your blog <laughs> is also something that's really valuable to the community. I will. Thanks a lot. Uh, all right. So I guess that's it for this round. Uh, we'll come back to Pierre for another round of questions. All right. So, in your sort of domain adaptation thing, you're working from the data set for the challenge. Uh -huh. They're all research centers, mm -hmm. they're all control subjects, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Uh, but really, your motivation is to, you know, we have people with a mess. I mean, that was your first slide, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's where you want to be. Um, do you think that this is a good enough proxy? Do you think that actually the kind of domain adaptation problems you're dealing with mm -hmm. are a good proxy of what you need to solve to get it to the clinic and, and translate? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. uh, in other words, are there other kinds of heterogeneity mm -hmm. that are critical and you detect like this? Yeah. yeah, if my uh, one thing that I, uh, one limitation that I assume that we had is that I meet, in the end, I missed a comparison on the, on the patient data set, where instead of using only health controls, right? So this is something that is missing. And to answer this question, it will be uh, nice to try it on, a, on, a, on data like this. We sh we, I tried this network on, uh, on some patients with some uh, MS lesions, and it showed that uh, uh, it's robust enough to the lesions, so it does not uh, leak to the lesions, I mean, it does not leak to the lesion like on the on traditional methods where you use morphology or anything like this, where you fill data and, uh, and to try to, to look for the neighbor pixels, uh, voxels. But uh, yeah, it, it is a good question, you know, in the end, uh, the, the, the question that I tried to, uh, to, to do, I think it is, you had this improvement on dice, right? But does this mean that it will be clinically significant to find some? And that is a good question, and that is a that, that I would say that is an uh, important next step to do on this work to to check those metrics on the clinical problems and to see that what is the you know like what is the it depends on the every task right so if you are looking like for segmenting the gray matter on MS patients right what will be a uh, reasonable dice that you need. Uh, to have a proper segmentation in order, to, and what will be the correlation with the disability, right? So this is this is what I think that is is important to do, and it's one limitation. Unfortunately, I have not done that, but yeah, uh, so it's important. Of but course. when you describe it, you you actually make a sort of like distinction. You care about segmentation, and mm -hmm. as oh, will that have any sort of clinical implication? But I mean, the, you could imagine that that's just a, yet another prediction problem that goes from the road that are. To the clinical prediction segmentation may or may not be <laughs> intermediate. No, yeah, that's, you know, true, that's true. That's true. That's and, true. I mean, just to quickly share insights that you know you, here you're dealing with essentially technical heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have different characteristics for your images. You need to deal with that, and definitely that the same thing is going to hold for mm -hmm. patients. 
But patients themselves, they can come in all shapes and forms, and depending on the pathology, they are more or less heterogeneous. I deal with Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. uh, which people usually associate with dementia, but only a third of patients with Alzheimer's dementia have Alzheimer's pathology in a pure form. Two thirds are a mix of stuff. Yes. And if one site has a particular type of Alzheimer's pathology and another site another type, you know, it's a whole new group level. Yes, I see. Heterogeneity that I, I don't think you've even started touching the part. Yeah, no, but yeah, the, I agree with that. Uh, I didn't touch the part of uh, the, the clinical, the uh, mm -hmm. clinical complication. Uh, but I would say that, you know, like, we, we saw that it, it is robust some lesions. So I would say that, uh, and even with, uh, since we had a lot of deformation in data documentation, so this, those volumes become almost sometimes irrecognizable mm -hmm. due to the data documentation. So I would say that this helps a lot and generalize for those cases where you have pathologists, right? So this is this might help because you are introducing some deformations in the in the data, and the network will learn to be invariant on that. And those deformations are sometimes very, uh, much worse in the data augmentation than uh -huh. what you find in, in, in the clinical practice. So, so your your intuition that it's gonna work. My intuition <laughs> is that it's gonna work, but I don't have numbers that. Yeah. Uh, um, so another kind of higher level question is that here. I mean, as I said earlier, I feel like some of your problems are important partly because of the regime of data you're dealing with, mm -hmm. There's a number of sites, sample sites. And um, what could you have done to clarify that, to make sure that your things, I mean, first of all, to demonstrate that your algorithm do improve mm -hmm. past the 80 subjects you looked at, and uh, to understand also the limitation mm -hmm. of when will they improve and well will they not improve. Okay, What yeah. else could you have done? Mm -hmm. So uh, what I could have done, of course, is the first uh, natural thing is to try with more data, right? So, okay. but to try with more data, you need more labels. This is yeah. one main problem. But uh, if, you, if you can provide more labels, you can, uh, you can have a better uh, estimate of how it will be, uh, you know, performing on the big data set. But however, uh, I would say that you might not be, uh, when you have a lot of data, this is, I would say that this is, uh, let's say that you are a company and you want to develop a model that will do this automatic segmentation, right? You, of course, you will have more data, right? Uh, but in the end, even if you have a lot of data, you will always have unlabeled data, right? So even that, it, as I said earlier, like, even if you train your, your baseline and you have a lot of data training, this model will never see this, this unlabeled data. So there, there will always be some information in there that will help your model to predict better, to provide better segmentation masks because they never saw this data, right? So, so okay, I, I, a more directed version of my uh, mm -hmm. question. Do you think that simulations could have helped you here? I mean, you, you do everything on the lead data. Mm -hmm. This is very not engineering. I don't, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, I don't think that simulation will help if, because I even tried to use GANs, and um, GANs usually provide very visual appealing uh, images that are sometimes even better than simulated images. And they didn't improve it. Um, so okay. So let, let me rephrase. So okay. I'm, at some point, you call the expert um, the expert tra uh, segmentations ground truths. Okay. Are they ground truths? No, they are. No, they're they're not. This is. I would say that this is. They uh, have ground yeah. Sometimes I use it, but it's, it, they are gold standards. They are gold standards. They're, they're not ground. They're not simulation. When I'm talking about simulation, I'm not talking about GANs. I'm talking about actually building data. Uh, more, more labels. Say, no, synthetically, just generate false data where you do mm -hmm. have ground truth. But the problem is to generate this kind of, uh, let me go back here too. This is one of the problems, yeah, to generate this kind of data. That's, that, that is the difficult part. How would you generate a, a synthetic data that uh, is visually looks like this? You, you, you wouldn't. There would be simpler than that, but then you would understand what you do. <laughs> you, know, you would have grown truth. But then let's say, but then let's say that improved. It, okay, uh -huh. you say that oh, you got a good model, but how does this perform in reality? You still have, remember the same original question, right? You have a simulation, but you still you know that it will be good simulation. But how does this then introduce another question? How good is simulation when compared to reality? 
Uh, I mean, I, I think it's it's good we reach that point. It means that I need to stop asking questions. I'm starting doing <laughs> philosophy here. Uh, this, is, this is an epistemologic debate. You know how, like I said, like I like that you have this theoretical motivation, and then you have all those like sort of large scale real data uh, analysis. I, I like that. But I feel like simulations are in between. You know, they're, 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 you seem to be happy that, you know, for the average, uh, moving mm -hmm. average model, there's mm -hmm. a theoretical argument telling you that it's better, and for you, it's, good, it's better. I like to do a simple simulation where I see, okay, in that case, it's better, in that case, it's not better. I then I feel like I really, wanna control I, it and, uh, at least in one particular example, I feel like I understand the limitations of what I do. Mm -hmm. And um, so just, you know, enough of the philosophical uh, makes sense. <laughs> Check but that was something missing, and you know, you traditionally in engineering work, you do have a simulation uh, uh, studies, and yes, they're very limited, and yes, mm -hmm. they're done, but at least you do have campus. Yeah, uh, makes sense. Makes sense. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. So, uh, so Julien? Yeah, very, very quick, uh, mm -hmm. mostly follow ups on the philosophical questions. I mean, I, I, I like the analogy between simulation and the real data. We, in, in many many fields, there is the same analogy between animal research and human research. Yeah. You know how, how does that translate to human research? I mean, kind of similar. So the in terms of clinical application, um, I think it's important to mention that you, you at the end you did train uh, you know the model that is implemented in a city yes. of several hundreds of, yeah. of uh, subjects, including patients with ALS, MS, uh, uh, like uh, cerebral myopathy. Um, uh, Syringal myelia. Mm -hmm. So th 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 there is patients, and, and we are, you know, every day we receive um, feedback from users all over the world saying that it works. So that's, you know, to me, it's better than the, than the you know, like the so called ground truth uh, evaluation. You know, it's like users actually happy. Um, the second comment, um, based on Nicolas' comment on the question of interpolation. So I did check the center of three is Zurich, and they, okay. they did use interpolation. Okay. Uh, so that's the center with you know the quote unquote high res, but I want to mention that this is, a, this is a fake high resolution because in fact when they acquired data, you know on the exam card they, they did check the uh, the box that says interpolation, so it's a case based interpolation. You know they don't acquire effectively higher uh, image resolution, right? They just interpolate on their data. Yeah. So you know that, that that also affects SNR and blah blah blah. Yeah, of course. So yeah, that's all. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I guess second round is always for kind of higher level. Um, mm. you, you, you do make this distinction uh, between uh, how much data is a large data set uh, and what is considered a small data set. And that's very application dependent. Uh, it's, it's remarkable that you show that even with a very small um, uh, uh, data set and even with unlabeled data sets, you're able to accomplish something that's uh, state of the art. Uh, what do you think about uh, the way MRI is going? Uh, is there going to be an exponential rise in the power of these approaches as we uh, add more and more data? Yes. And uh, is there a plateau to that rise? Yeah, I think, I think that uh, right now we are in the, of course it depends on the task, right? It depends on the, uh, the kind of data, but uh, I would say that right now we, we still don't have enough data to train high uh, high capacity models, such as uh, the ones that we train like on ImageNet. And ImageNet, uh, ImageNet has millions of uh, of images, right? So this is uh, this is something that we don't have on MRI. Uh, however, I would say that uh, my expectation is that it will happen the same this, the same effect that happened with natural images on investigation will happen with uh, medical image, which is uh, you will start to to get a huge boost when you uh, when you start to get more data, right? And acquire more data and get better uh, quality segmentations and uh, gold standards. Uh, but the problem is that when you reach the point where you had a lot of data, you start to get diminishing returns, right? So, for instance, ImageNet challenge, for instance, that there's a lot of uh, people that just stop the participating on that because it's just diminishing returns. You just uh, you have so much data that your models uh, reach into a, a limit where it's very, it's very close to the human performance already and it even surpasses the human performance in classification, natural image. But uh, it, it's right now we start to get diminishing returns, right? Because 
you already have a lot of data, you have a lot of variability that you need, and your models are capturing uh, the most that they can, right? So uh, if nothing comes after this, uh, uh, to, to improve this or, or to improve the, the, the kind of, the, the, the variability of patterns that those models can capture, I would say that the same thing will happen on medical imaging. We will reach a, a plateau uh, where you will not be able to uh, increase a lot of your performance. But the, I would say that we are still far away of that because we have like a, a huge data sets in, in, in the medical imaging is like 5,000 samples and the image net is, the, the entire image net is 14, uh, more than 14 million images. So we are still very, very, very far from what the models can offer, from what the models can learn. So I, I would say that the, the more data, we, we still have a lot of uh, years to come where we will still uh, improve the models just by adding data and not changing models. And you think that plateau will happen pretty much when we get to human level performance at superhuman level speeds, at least for this kind of application? Uh, or should we believe that uh, deep learning will actually perform much better than humans in the short future? I, I think it will perform better than humans, especially because uh, the problem is that those models are trained with uh, gold standards from humans, right? And those gold standards are problematic. Not our, uh, they don't agree with each other, right? And when we saw, especially for, for instance, in the MS lesions, Charlie the, uh, published a paper where it showed that the, uh, the, the agreement between raters, between the experts in notation is, is, is not quite good. So uh, I would say that it will be better than the experts in that sense, because it will uh, converge to this expectation of many raters together. So this is good because it removes the bias. Uh, and uh, in that sense, I would say that it will be better than, uh, than a single human right? uh, rating. Uh, in, in speed, it's already better, right? Because you cannot like uh, segment a volume with like, like 4,000 slices in a few minutes, like you, like you do with uh, deep learning. But uh, the issue is that this is, we still need a lot of data. And this data has to come for, from humans, right? And uh, I would say that it will depend on the quality of this data as well and uh, what, to what we compare. So to say that it's better than human, uh, we will compare with what? With, uh, with mm -hmm. data that are performed by humans, right? So it's really difficult to say that it's better than human um, on data that was created by human, right? So it's, uh, it's, a, it's also a philosophical question. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So uh, I guess your prediction, exponential rise until? <laughs> I don't know. It's a, it's really, it's, it takes a lot of time to do those labels. So <laughs> to create a huge uh, label data set, there, there, you know, like people will need to get together and, uh, and it's, it's not like on a machine learning for natural images where they have a lot plenty of data available on the internet that you can just download and crawl it and that's it. You need the actual people to do this label manually every, every time. So I would say that it would take a lot of years to to have a huge data set that can be used to, you know, like that will transfer good to those kind of domains. And like, the next AI winter comes in five years, 10 years, 50 years or never? That's a good question. I would say that uh, the, the previous AI winter that happened was uh, because, you know, there was too many expectations and uh, uh, research was not able to met those expectations. But nowadays, you know, Deep learning models are being used on every. So I would say that AI winter will come because we are already using those models and they are useful for a lot of things, right? So I don't think it uh, will be another AI winter, but it might happen that uh, it will start to plateau again, right? If nothing new comes out from research labs, right? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we'll open it up to the audience now questions from uh, people in the room or those on uh, Zoom? Everyone's shy. <laughs> if somebody on Zoom has a question, you can also ch type it in the chat window if you don't feel comfortable speaking. I'm monitoring the chat. All right, so I think that's a wrap for the public portion of the defense. So uh, thank you, Christian. Thank you, everybody who attended. We will uh, take a 
couple of minutes to discuss, uh, Julian, Pierre, and myself, and uh, we will call you back in in about 10 minutes or so. Okay. Uh, uh, Yeah. So this is something. Um,